West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Des photos de bord de mer Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver Fox News has been facing one of its worst periods ever, and that's objectively, measurably speaking. It's rocked by not only the scandals over the admitted lies in the 2020 election, which could cost over a billion dollars in court, but also a kind of a wider credibility crisis. And you may say, oh, well, maybe you don't believe that Fox is that credible anyway. We've certainly seen evidence of that. But now, politically, top Republicans this week are refusing to even defend the network or its embattled chief, Rupert Murdoch. Now, if you've been following this story, you probably noticed it really hasn't been some he said, she said type story. It's not like the people suing Fox say bad things and then Fox denies them. It's actually quite the opposite. I've told you about this in some of our accounts. Some of the worst damning material has come from both hard evidence, which Fox cannot credibly deny in court, but also from new statements by Rupert Murdoch and top Fox people where they confess they endorse these lies, or that the executives were wrong. The wily 91-year-old chief is quite skilled at this. So, when it looks like he's losing, or even close to a surrender, I've told you before, if it's Murdoch, look closer. Because we have mentioned in previous reports about how he deals with these kind of things, how he proverbially stays alive in business and politics, and tonight we have new reporting that bears some of this out. And that actually brings us to an important person that you may know less about. She's usually behind the scenes, but she's the boss of Tucker and Hannity, Fox News CEO Suzanne Scott. And now reporter Oliver Darcy is citing a source who says the Murdochs are, quote, setting Scott up to take the fall for all of this. Another source saying, quote, they're leading a trail of crumbs that lead back to her office. And Murdoch testified that Scott is the one, quote, responsible for everything on Fox News. So even as Murdoch admits some failures, seems to go deeper into a hole, then suddenly looks like they're getting ready to throw somebody else into the hole. Now, this is not some legal strategy of strength. It's not how you start a court case. It's not your first move. But if you're down or down by a lot, it can be a way to try to pivot out of the free fall. Indeed, the very character based on Rupert Murdoch in HBO's hit Succession memorably calls this exact move, over in the fictional version, a blood sacrifice. No one to say all this time for a blood sacrifice. I mean, I think the obvious choice is, and I hate to say it because he's such a swell guy, is Tom. Excuse me? Yeah. Tom works. Uh, there's kind of a clarity, I think. Yeah. Yeah. They don't care to speak to my qualities? No, Tom looks logical. What? Now, on the show, that icy process makes for some Baroque humor. But back in real life, which inspired the show, Mr. Murdoch is being blunt. He is testifying executives at fault should be reprimanded or fired. Asked under oath about consequences for them if they allow lies to be broadcast knowingly, you see it right here. Quote, 
they should be reprimanded or maybe gotten rid of. Already you could see him hashing out the outlines of this plan even under his originally secret deposition. Fox News already canceled Lou Dobbs' show around the time these cases heated up. But Murdoch could find himself under fire as well, even as he tries to pass off the blame. Indeed, it's probably because he knows that, that he's looking at firing such top people or trying to legally blame them. The filing that we have, that we've been reporting on, still does put Murdoch at the top and epicenter of all this. He was asked quite specifically, well, you could have said to Scott, this potential fall person, or to the host, stop putting Giuliani on the air. Giuliani on the air. Answer, quote, I could have, but I didn't. Now, Murdoch also has an explanation for this. He insists there was no malice, just him doing business, pursuing what he testified he calls, quote, the green. Kind of a flip of the classic Wu-Tang line where we're told, cream, cash rules everything around me. Except here, apparently, the M is for Murdoch. Andrew Weissman, the former Mueller prosecutor and FBI general counsel, uh, his thoughts on Wu-Tang we may get to later in the interview. But as for right now, just thanks for being here. Nice to be here. So this, to, since we're talking about fictional things, it's this is, you know, the story is greed is good is, you know, because you have him saying it's not blue and it's not red. It's green. That is one of the things that Murdoch testified to. That is just the worst possible sentence for a jury to hear hmm. um, because they're going to be hearing um, not just about sort of regular compensatory damages, but they will, if there is a trial, they will be able to decide on punitive damages. And that kind of line is the kind of line that I think would make a jury quite upset. Um, and you would, I, I and you would know, Andrew, I mean, you would know, and this goes to how smart is Murdoch, how on his A game is he? I'm not taking anything away from him with regard to his efficacy. We could talk about his, his failures, his ethics, the endorsement of the lies, but his efficacy is he seems to think that he can push others out front and then he can back away and say, it was just business. You see limits to that how? Yeah, so I think that might be a perfectly good strategy for the public, but I don't see that working in any way in a court of law, which you alluded to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the way the law works, it doesn't matter if it turns out that it's just incredibly powerful anchors who are doing this with malice, or if it's the CEO who's doing this with malice. It, you know, all of that gets imputed to the company. And it's the company that is on trial. Um, it also, so in other words, the fact that the very, very top of the company is not involved wouldn't be a defense. Now, I also think that is a very hard factual thing based on the brief that we all read. It's a very hard factual claim to make because you know everyone knows that Fox is controlled by Murdoch and now Lachlan, his son, and they appear to be all over the reaction uh, to what happened when they called Arizona for Biden. And the, and the theory here is Dominion says because of that reaction, you know, all hell broke loose internally with the anchors realizing the stock was going to go down. Tucker Carlson saying, let's fire people who tell us that we should tell the truth because we really don't want to have our stock decline. So I don't, I don't think factually it's going to work. And I don't think legally it works to say, oh, it's only sort of the person who reported to me. Right. Who well, legally responsible and legally, that's what's fascinating, because there are businesses that can run almost amorally and it's a defense to them doing business. No one's suing Disney over Mickey Mouse and saying there's no talking mouse. That's not a defamation claim because they deal in fiction. The problem here is that what everyone thinks right. of Fox News and they've been caught lying, um, they are on trial for knowing deliberate defamation and lying. Um, so saying, hey, we just put this out doesn't work on a defamation case, which is different perhaps than some other places where, where Murdoch might have tried these defenses. I want to play for you how some of this is piercing the conservative bubble. We've talked about uh, whether people are hearing about this or not. Uh, I've told viewers there's a lot of signs that uh, this could be the straw that breaks the proverbial uh, liar's back, if you will. Um, here's some of what happened on Hannity's radio show. You knew the election wasn't stolen from Trump, and you guys lied about it anyway because you felt you had a good reason. No, if you listen to what I said on the air every day, what did I talk about? 
Well, let me remind you. Many Americans do not believe that this election was fair. I feel that way. It's a corrupt and an embarrassing disgrace. I'm asking you if you all knew that the election wasn't stolen from Trump and yet you... No, 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 you're not listening to what I'm saying. I said I had problems that there were integrity issues. Our Dominion systems prone to human error. 72 million Americans voted for Donald Trump. All of them, all of us deserve an answer. Andrew, my final question to you is not strictly courtroom legal, um, but in the broader sense of the legal reasoning you've used throughout your quite considerable legal career to do fact finding. I mean, that's part of what, what you, your tools you used in the Mueller investigation and FBI. Um, when you see facts like this emerge, do you think that writ large over time, whatever the resolution of this case, um, they can affect um, the standing in the sense of how we categorize Fox News as a society? Does that matter? Yeah, that is a great question. The, the way I think about this is I think about disinformation outside of a courtroom where we're all infected by politicians and unfortunately significant media outlets where there doesn't seem to be any repercussion for that. And what is going on in a court of law where, as a judge said, Amy Berman Jackson, who was the judge over the Manafort case, she said, you know, this is a place where facts still matter. And by and large, the judiciary has really fared very well, because what we're seeing here is a place where facts matter. And so Fox News, the reason they're, quote, getting caught is because it's a place where what they have, have been doing is now being exposed in a place where facts actually matter. So whatever spin they're doing in public um, and whatever they can get away with, um, it'll be interesting to see whether what happens in court, um, to your point, really sort of seeps out and people react to it saying, you know what, we now see the reality. And then very much the way that the January 6th committee tried to do that exact same thing, which was to put out in public all of the facts about the plot that was going on and that you have written about um, about the various aspects of it. So I think it's really similar. Yeah, I don't want to thank you uh, for what you said and the points you raised. I don't want to go too highbrow. It is still the beat, Andrew, and we keep it real. <laughs> um, but I am a little bit reminded of one of the things Tocqueville said about the good part of American culture, um, which is that the, the traditions of the courtroom done right um, facts and our peers as the backstop, not not elites, not the the rich, not a monarch. Our peers are the courtroom backstop in the jury, and the facts are what we're all supposed to work on. If people do that in good faith, 12 very different people can come together. They'll be asked to do that if this case goes to trial. Uh, and at a time with so many problems, that might be uh, some silver lining for us tonight. It is Friday. The 3rd of March of 2023, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Blue Moon Spirits Fridays because we are all Nighthawks in the Diner of Life. Oh, yeah. Well, um, how are you? We are headed into the weekend, and don't we deserve it? I think we do. Now, some people like to turn off the news on the weekend because they need a respite from all the din. But, um, and some people don't. And I don't know, I think maybe it is sort of a healthy uh, uh, practice to maybe, you know, turn it off, go silent. Yeah, there's one of those silent caves here nearby in Ashland um, where, I guess, what, the uh, Green Bay quarterback, the anti-vaxxer guy, he went to uh, recharge or I don't know. So that sounds like fun. Yeah. I sat in an isolation tank when I was in uh, university. Didn't you guys? You know, back when people were streaking and there were also isolation tanks where you... Uh, floated in uh, a tank that was completely sealed up in warm water about your body temperature yeah, to the point where you didn't feel the water essentially it wasn't warm wasn't cold it was just right and you were supposed to float in there in the dark and um, um, I don't know 
<laughs> either come to grips or it was the military testing who could be brainwashed and who couldn't. I don't know. Either one. Either complete self-awareness or they're testing to see who can be brainwashed. I, they, you, you come to those conclusions or assessments while uh, sitting in the dark for a considerable time floating. So, uh, yeah, I think going into a cave, I don't know, sort of like that, except I like the idea of floating in, in, uh, water that you don't feel. I, I it's just something about that in the dark. Okay. So, uh, Oh, don't do any uh, psychedelics in it. Some people can handle it. Most can't. So I'm just saying, you know, take care. All right. Well, I don't know. We got onto a tangent of uh, way back, <laughs> didn't we? Yes, yes. Well, you know, we got to remember history because apparently they're trying to make everybody forget. Jeez. I mean, you got this. Is it Mississippi? Mississippi uh, state senator said, well, hell, if we're going to have the firing squad for death penalty, why don't we just hang them from a tree? Yeah. All right, let's bring Lynch in back. That's a good one. For the public, he actually said for the public, I guess he wants to sell postcards of lynchings in Mississippi again because, hey, if we're going to be anti-woke, what's more anti-woke than that? Jesus Christ. All right. Now, Armando has argued that woke was never adopted by leadership in the Democratic Party, and but it's been saddled on us as if, you know, whatever. I would argue that it's, yeah, I can see that. Because I don't remember the term politically correct necessarily coming, coming from our side. It was picked up as a point of derision. You want me to be politically correct? You know, something that was like bannered about in uh, the cafeteria at a university one time about how people shouldn't use their elbows when they're trying to get past each other with a tray of food. And apparently the ones who want to use their elbows considered, well, you just trying to be politically correct. And it became, a, you know, a pejorative. You're PC. When basically all the argument was, as if it was an argument, was a suggestion. It was like, hey, we're in America. Be a good neighbor. And the argument against that was, you can't force me to be a good neighbor. No way. Oh, wow. <laughs> and that's what that's all about. And this whole thing about woke is you can't force me not to be a bigot. You can't force me to not be small minded prejudiced, prone to superstition. Okay. <sighs> Maybe. I don't know if it's government, but, you know, the whole idea about being a good neighbor is that the rest of the neighborhood is supposed to shun those types and not, you know, like, oh, oh they're, they're too aggressive. I have to, like... Be afraid. Oh, don't, don't say anything back. Oh, no, they might come out with a shotgun. And they often do, but I don't think that's any reason to keep from telling them that they are in the wrong. Shunning can happen in two ways. Yep. You want to build a wall around yourself? Here, let us help. Now, when you want to come out, pay a toll. <laughs> I don't know what could be more libertarian than that. I don't want to pay for public transportation. I don't want to pay for the streets. Okay. They, you know, their idea is like wherever your property line is on your setback, uh, you know, that, that that is your domain and you should be able to collect a toll for that. And there'll be a toll for every, what, 70 some 120 feet in some Towns, townships, or such. Give me a break. But that's libertarian heaven. Mm hmm. 
Oh, did I? Yes, I did mention I got into a tete-a-tete with a fellow uh, KPFA or KPFK. I can't remember, but uh, libertarian guy, and I wore. Yeah, sure, sure, they all are. Yeah, right. And um, uh, got into a little bit of a tete-a-tete, and I, I, I just have to remind people: libertarians are not liberals, even if they are on Pacifica. Okay, give me. I just want to be clear about that. Yeah, the anti-war movement has strange bedfellows, but I I don't know. I don't know. Not my cup of tea. Okay? A little bit too much like LaRouche for my taste. Remember that guy and his cult? His ilk? Boy, I used to have to uh, get by the gauntlet of LaRouche types getting off a BART, you know, like a uh, Market Street or, you know, Union Square, that area around there. Jeez, get me a break. And yeah, you know, I used to, you know, shall we say mock them. They don't like being mocked. But I don't know. I was told at one point in my life that I looked like a big old biker and that I was rather intimidating. And I went, what? Me? And then I, I don't know, I saw some photographs of myself and I tried to put myself into the mindset of like, I don't know that guy. And I went, yeah, you know, I guess I could have looked a, a little, I don't know if intimidating, mean. I don't know if I look mean, but let's just say <laughs> most of the time people left me alone. I wasn't so big they wanted to take down the big guy and I wasn't so small that I was the victim. I was, I don't know, sort of like in between. Anyway, uh, the Proud Boys, I think, are, I, I couldn't call them LaRouches, but they have a certain sort of, I don't know, swagger so, uh, that, that that is very similar. And uh, except, well, let's just be clear, you know, the, the Proud Boys, by and large, are a bunch of troglodytes, aren't they? You know, so... Stormtroopers, Goose Steppers, Zieg Heil, kick your ass. All right. Well, uh, I don't know. Maybe it's time to say that they can't act and behave that way in proper society. If they don't want to be in proper society and they want to wall themselves off from society, we can help. We can give them a bunch of gated communities. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, you know, I think the Proud Boys, by and large, they, they would like gated communities, you know. They got the the strip mall with everything that they like, you know, Wingstop and all of that BS. Uh, they'll have a Botox thing for the gals to keep their Botox uh, fix going. And uh, the the little uh, man-made fake lake in the middle of it with with maybe some sort of, like, really neat water feature. And they can have like a marina for their little tiny little uh, six foot uh, sailboats that they can take out on the little man made lake. Maybe we'll even put a a little island in the middle of it, for, you know, a feature island with some bonsai uh, landscaping, maybe. But you gotta have that water fountain feature going. That's really important. And they'll be happy, and the guard shacks will be turned to the inside, and they'll never know. They will never know. All right. They'll be happy as clams. They'll have their safe space. You want a safe space? We'll give you a safe space here. And I would think that the outlay of funds to support that would be a lot less than what could be wrought by just letting them run amok as they are. All right. Sometimes mommy and daddy got to set their foot down and tell the kids you are misbehaving and you need a time out. Except I think at this point we're trying to get them into juvie because they have been so incorrigible. That's where we are. All right. Do we really want to let that get out in the world more than it already has? You know, Billy Bragg is having a concert in South Africa, and there's an anti-trans uh, lady who's showing up to cause a bunch of, bunch of mayhem. And uh, she's not just anti-trans, you know, anti 
anything to do with gay, homosexuality, et cetera, et cetera. And anti-abortionist and funded by anti U.S., as Billy Bragg says, U.S. anti-abortionists. And he, he called for folks to come out and protest their presence. And, well, they should. We are exporting this BS because I suppose if you got chaos in the world, who benefits from that kind of chaos? Who now who is trying to expand their borders might uh, might benefit from that right now? Hmm. Yeah, the mind reels trying to consider who that might be, huh? <laughs> Yes, it does. Well, why don't we get into what we have in store for you here on this fabulous Blue Moon Spirits Fridays, the end of the week, which in some ways is the beginning of even more mayhem because it is the weekend and you never know what the seditious caucus is up to. Well, actually, we we are very well aware what they are up to. It isn't hard to figure out. They're so predictable. Anyway, at the top, yeah, Murdoch's Wu-Tang defense could go up in smoke. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I think they really need to, you know, get hurt where it hurts. And he's got a lot of money and they just love money. But but it's got to hurt. Can't just be like, oh, okay, well, this is the cost of doing business. No, it has to really hurt. On the rest of the menu... California's snow-stranded mountain residents need food, plows, and help. A man who spent more than 38 years behind bars for a 1983 murder he did not commit was declared innocent. Innocent! And two Kansas men were arrested on charges of selling aviation tech to... Yeah, Russia. For quite a while, too. In spite of the law. After the break, we move to the chef's table, where the head of Japan's wrecked Fukushima nuclear plant says it is too early to predict when its decommissioning will be completed. You know, it's only been 12 years. And the French Senate began debate on raising the retirement age to 64. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. At netrootsradio.com, to the right of the page is the chat room link, and the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. To the uh, left of that chat room link across the page, there is the link to our Patreon page. And do please become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio. It really does help. And if you could send us what you might spend on an espresso-type coffee drink once a month, uh, we're able to pool that with other like-minded folk, and that's the way we are able to pay our bills and continue this powerhouse of resistance that has been resisting all these many, many years. Thank you for your generosity. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, Mastodon, and Spoutable, you can do so by going to at Netroots Radio. How simple is that? And Tom takes care of those, and we thank Tom for doing so as well. Follow me on Twitter, Mastodon, and Spoutable at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary. I know they're trying to call them stories, but they are diaries. Because we're old school. Anyway... That diary gets posted 10 minutes before showtime and all the attendant links that you need to have to be able to get to the actual articles are there. 
fancy that. And if you want to follow the show on Twitter, you can do so at Cookbook West and please pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, and wherever podcasts can be found. Yay. All right. This first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Blue Moon Spirits Fridays, is by Ben Finley and Amy Taxon from the Associated Press. Olivia Duke said she's been trapped in her home in the snow-plastered mountains east of L.A., that's Los Angeles, for so long that by yesterday Thursday, the only food she had left was oatmeal. Snowplows have created a wall of ice between her driveway and the road in the San Bernardino Mountains, and there are at least five feet of snow weighing on her roof. Get that off. While her power has been restored, she only has half a gallon of gas left for her generator in case it goes out again. California is not used to this. We don't have this kind of snow, said Duke, a corporate recruiter who lives in the community of Cedar Pines Park. I thought I was prepared, but not for this kind of Godzilla bomb of snow. This is something you couldn't possibly really have prepared for. With Southern California mountain communities under a snow emergency, residents are grappling with power outages, roof collapses, and lack of baby formula and medicine. Many have been trapped in their homes for a week, their cars buried in snow. County workers fielded more than 500 calls for assistance on Wednesday, while firefighters tackled possible snow-related explosions and evacuated the most vulnerable with snowcats. Californians are usually elated to see snow-covered mountains from Los Angeles and drive a couple of hours up to sled, ski, and snowboard. But what started out as a beautiful sight has become a hazardous nightmare for those renting vacation homes in the scenic tree-lined communities or who live there year-round. Back-to-back snowstorms have blanketed the region repeatedly, giving people no time to even shovel out. Some resort communities received as much as 10 feet of snow over the past week. Uh, So much snow fell that ski resorts had to close and roads became impassable. No snow was following yesterday, Thursday, and authorities said they hoped to clear as much as possible from the roads while the weather was benign. California Governor Gavin Newsom declared an emergency in 13 counties late Wednesday and called up the National Guard to assist. Press staff brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A man who spent more than 38 years behind bars for a 1983 murder he did not commit was declared innocent by a judge in Los Angeles on Wednesday. Maurice Hastings was released from prison last year after long untested DNA evidence pointed to a different suspect. The judge in October vacated Hastings' conviction at the request of prosecutors with the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office and his lawyers from the Los Angeles Innocence Project. Prosecutors and Hastings' lawyers returned to court to ask Judge William C. Ryan to take the additional step and declare him innocent of the killing 40 years ago. The judge's decision or the judge's declaration of Hastings as factually innocent means the evidence proves conclusively that Hastings did not commit the crime. District Attorney George Gascon said Hastings survived a nightmare. He spent nearly four decades in prison, exhausting 
every avenue to prove his innocence while being repeatedly denied, Gascon said in the statement. But Mr. Hastings has remained steadfast and faithful that one day he could hear a judge proclaim his innocence. Gascon said the ruling will clear Hastings' name and pave the way for him to seek possible relief in connection with his wrongful conviction. The victim in the case, Roberta Weidermeyer, was sexually assaulted and killed by a single gunshot to the head, authorities said. Her body was found in the trunk of her vehicle in the city of Inglewood, near Los Angeles. Hastings was charged with special circumstance murder, and the district attorney's office sought the death penalty, but the jury deadlocked. A second jury convicted him, and he was sentenced in 1988 to life in prison without possibility of parole. Hastings maintained he was innocent since his arrest. At the time of the victim's autopsy, the coroner conducted a sexual assault examination and semen was detected in an oral swab. Hastings sought DNA testing in 2000, but at that time, the DA's office denied the request. Hastings submitted a claim of innocence to the DA's Conviction Integrity Unit in 2021, and DNA testing last June found that the semen was not his. The DNA profile was put into a state database and matched to a person who was convicted of an armed kidnapping and forced copulation of a female victim who was placed in a vehicle's trunk. That suspect, Kenneth Packnett, died in prison in 2020. Hastings, who was 69 years old when he walked out of prison last October, told reporters at the time that he had prayed every day of his freedom would come. I am not standing up here a bitter man, Hastings said, but I just want to enjoy my life now while I have it. of the Associated Press brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. The Justice Department yesterday Thursday arrested two Kansas men on allegations that the pair illegally exported aviation-related technology to Russia and provided repair services for the equipment. Cyril Gregory Bionofsky and Douglas Robertson are charged with conspiracy, exporting controlled goods without a license, falsifying and failing to file electronic export information and smuggling goods in violation of U.S. law. The charges come as the U.S. has drastically ramped up sanctions and financial penalties on Russia since its invasion of Ukraine began on the 24th of February of 2022. Along with thousands of sanctions on people and firms, export controls on the Kremlin are meant to limit access to computer chips and other products needed to equip a modern military. The Justice Department says Boyanovsky and Robertson owned and operated Can Rus Trading Company, which supplied aircraft electronics to Russian companies and provided repair services for equipment used in Russian manufactured aircraft. The indictment says that since 2020, they conspired to evade U.S. export laws by concealing and misstating the true end users and destinations of their exports and by shipping equipment through third-party countries. They face up to 35 years in prison if convicted. 
Lawyers for Bayanovsky and Robertson could not be identified from the provided documents, and the Justice Department did not immediately respond to a request for their information. Well, that brings us to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world, and we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. This week, a tale of two marvels. First, the tagline for 1978's Superman was, You'll believe a man can fly. And it took a crew of special effects people doing blue screen compositing, front projection, rigs and wires, and even a specially designed dual focusing camera process that allowed them to zoom into Christopher Reeve while zooming out simultaneously from his background to make it seem like he was flying towards you. It looked great in 78 and the film won a Special Achievement Academy Award for Special Effects. 45 years later, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania, makes that film magic seem like shadow puppets. Read Anthony Bresnikin's Vanity Fair article about how these people conceived the quantum world. Production designer Will Hatte basically said, whatever we can imagine, we will make happen. I cannot stress how amazing the design of this film is. It's insane the seamless blend of CGI, models, wacky sets, and the work of half a dozen special effects companies, all bringing you a gangbang love child of Star Wars, Dune, and Flash Gordon pumped full of steroids and LSD and exploded on PIM growth particles onto the big screen. Second, I just rewatched 2021's Eternals, and I still like it, but it left me uneasy. In Eternals, our heroes chose Earth while dooming planets of unseen and unknowable beings to non-existence. In Avengers Infinity War and Avengers Endgame, our immediate familial and social relations are worth the suffering and death of distant billions. If our failures to address our ongoing climate apocalypse and the global pandemic show us anything, it's that these priorities are certainly human, or maybe just certainly American. Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania, does the same thing. And again, I remained entertained and uneasy. While that moral framework may make us heroes to the loved ones we've saved, what does it make us to those we've chosen not to? This has been Take-Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. Catch up with us at Take-TwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. Some caterpillars have evolved with an antifreeze in their body cavities, allowing them to become caterpopsicles to survive cold winters. But climate change could threaten that. There are caterpillars that have been reported to be put into an ice cube and frozen, and then when the ice cube melts, they can get up and walk away. You may have seen them scooting around on leaf litter in the fall. They're furry, rotund, and famous for their rumored weather forecasting skills. I'm talking about the woolly bear caterpillar, or Isabella tiger moth. These little creatures have an orange waistband stripe whose width is rumored to predict how long winter might be. And while this is based in colonial folklore, not science, what is scientifically amazing is how the woolly bear caterpillar is able to survive winter. I'm Kate Furby, and you're listening to Science Quickly. Unlike humans and other mammals, caterpillars can't regulate their body temperatures. And unless they burrow or cocoon, they're subject to the wind and rain. The woolly bear caterpillar, like its name, is covered in a spiky-looking fuzz. And those hairs you might think of as a little down jacket for the caterpillar to wear, and I'm sure that they do provide a little bit of insulation. That's Dr. Martha Weiss, a biologist and professor at Georgetown University who studies plant-insect interactions. She says that the spiky little caterpillar jacket has a specific use, but not what you might think. Those hairs are thought to have evolved as a way to protect the caterpillars against predators. 
and maybe against parasitoids that want to lay their eggs inside the caterpillar's body. Yikes, that is a super powered little jacket, actually. But here's the caterpillar's dilemma. The main thing is that it gets really cold and they have a lot of water in them and they can freeze. And so they need to be able to deal with freezing temperatures. And while the famous furry jacket provides protection, it doesn't provide the kind of insulation woolly bear caterpillars need for a hard Chicago winter. What they do is a little more biochemical. They have more biochemical tricks up their sleeves, insofar as caterpillars could be said to have sleeves. Oh, wow. They would have to have like 16 little sleeves. But OK, what are their options for survival? They can also do biochemical things and physiological things to make it less likely that they will turn into an ice cube. So what some of those caterpillars do is they use antifreeze. They basically make compounds like glycerol that they put into their cells. In case you're not familiar with glycerol, it's a natural alcohol compound. It works similarly to when we salt city sidewalks to keep them from becoming icy. The compounds in the woolly caterpillar's body lower its freezing point, buying it some time. And then they do something even more remarkable. They move water out of their cells so that it freezes in the extracellular space. That's because... Water, of course, gets bigger when it turns to ice. And so if a cell was filled with water and it froze, then it would it could bust the cell membrane and that would really harm the caterpillar. So getting the water out of the cell is a good idea and lowering the temperature at which the liquid freezes is also a good idea. So these little guys can freeze solid all winter and then thaw out and get up and walk away come spring. And they can actually freeze and thaw multiple times over the course of a winter. But there's an energetic cost that comes to falling asleep and waking back up again. Studies of the Isabella tiger moth have shown that they can, in fact, undergo several freeze-thaw cycles, but it's really not great for them. It's better if they can freeze, stay frozen, and then thaw at the end of the winter. And not only that. I think there's also some damage that happens to some of the structures in the caterpillar. Some of the more delicate parts, I think, can be damaged a little bit. And the more times they have to freeze, thaw, and refreeze, the more likelihood that they'll be a little worse for wear at the end of the winter. And this gets worse because of things like climate change. If we have winter heat waves or warm periods when caterpillars that had been in the deep freeze thaw out and then freeze again, um, there was some concern that they would be able to go back and forth between these conditions. That'll also lead to larger ecological implications. Caterpillar populations and therefore butterfly or moth populations could take a hit if the overwintering survival is interfered with by these interludes of warmer weather that prevent them from getting through their wintering period in the same way that they had before. And that might have more profound impacts than we think. We already know that some important pollinators, like bees and butterflies, are struggling to survive due to all kinds of human activities. Caterpillars are important just because they're such cool animals, but they also are a phase of the life cycle of lepidopterans, so moths and butterflies. They are pollinators, they're herbivores, they're food for birds and other organisms, and they're just part of what makes the world fun to look at and live in. For Scientific Americans, Science Quickly, I'm Kate Furby. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetrootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power Netroots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of NetrootsRadio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1893. That was the day that William Green 
longtime president of the American Federation of Labor, was born in Coshocton, Ohio. Green's family were English and Welsh immigrant miners. He entered the mines at the age of 16. Before he was 20, he had become secretary of the Coshocton Progressive Miners Union. That local would eventually join the United Mine Workers of America. By 1906, Green had risen to lead the Ohio chapter of the UMWA. Less than two decades later, when longtime leader of the American Federation of Labor, Samuel Gompers, died, Green was named his successor. Green believed in union management cooperation. He thought labor could win more gains at the table with management than they could standing in opposition. Green helped secure some major legislative victories for labor, including the 1935 National Labor Relations Act, which strengthened collective bargaining rights. He also supported the Fair Labor Standards Act, which established the 40-hour workweek and the minimum wage. His tenure at the helm of the AFL was during some of the most tumultuous years in U.S. labor history. This was an era of massive sit-down strikes and organizing drives for workers in industries like steel, meatpacking, and the auto industry. Green supported organizing industrial workers, but the AFL's leadership at the time, by and large, favored skilled trade labor. Increasingly, Green clashed with UMWA President John L. Lewis over the question of industrial unions. This led to a split in the labor movement and the formation of the separate Congress of Industrial Organizations. Green continued to lead the AFL until his death in 1952. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America where it is currently 33 degrees Fahrenheit expecting a high in the low 40s. We are currently under and have been under a winter weather advisory and we should be cloudy throughout the day and uh, winds will be light and variable but later on this afternoon those partly cloudy skies will give way to occasional snow showers beginning in the late afternoon and overnight lows in the upper 20s Winds light and variable, and we're expecting snow accumulations overnight of around an inch. And then rain and snow in the morning with scattered thunderstorms in the afternoon on Saturday. Highs in the mid-30s, winds out of the southwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Uh, The chance of rain is looking like we're going to get about a quarter inch. But then the snowfall later on is going to be around two inches. So we'll look forward to that. And as I mentioned before, it looks like we will have a snowy mix, though more emphasis on the snow through the rest of the week. We'll see how and if that changes. The air quality, oh, I'm sorry, pollen is rated none Still here in the town of Rogue River, Oregon, the air quality index for the region is in the good range at 33 parts per million. And the daytime UV index has ticked down into the low range at level two. Barometric pressure is holding steady at 30.24 inches. Visibility is at four miles and relative humidity is at 98 percent. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 45 degrees and cloudy. Paris is 48 and sunny. Rome is 56 degrees with showers in the vicinity. Kiev is 38 degrees and cloudy. 
Kabul is 43 degrees and fair. Hong Kong is 64 and fair. Tokyo is 45 and partly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 70 degrees and cloudy. San Francisco, California is 48 degrees and partly cloudy with a small craft advisory on the bay and offshore. And New York, New York is 44 degrees Fahrenheit, fair, with a gale warning. Fair, with a gale warning? Well, that's New York for you. And that is weather from around the world. Brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Blue Moon Spirits Fridays is by Mari Yamaguchi from the Associated Press. The head of Japan's wrecked Fukushima nuclear power plant says details of the damage inside its reactors are only beginning to be known 12 years after it was hit by a massive earthquake and tsunami making it difficult to foresee when or how its decommissioning will be completed. The most pressing immediate task is to safely start releasing large amounts of treated but still radioactive water from the plant into the sea, Akira Ono said in an interview with the AP. The March 2011 earthquake and tsunami damaged cooling systems at the Fukushima Daiichi plant causing three reactors to melt and release large amounts of radiation. The operator, Tokyo Electric Power Company, uh, has been able to stabilize the plant to the point where the company can better plan a decommissioning strategy expected to be lengthy and exceedingly challenging. The status of the debris in the primary containment chambers of Unit 1, 2, and 3 reactors remains largely unknown. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mes automnes Quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Sylvie Corbet of the Associated Press brings us this Final amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The French Senate started debating President Emmanuel Macron's contested pension plan yesterday, Thursday, and the centrist government hopes to find a compromise with conservative members of the upper house of parliament to be able to push the bill through. Macron has vowed to go ahead with a bill which aims to raise the country's minimum retirement age from 62 to 64 by 2030, despite nationwide demonstrations and strikes and opinion polls consistently showing a majority of French people oppose the change. Workers' union and youth organizations pledge to bring France to a standstill during the next protest, which is scheduled for March 7th. The National Assembly's two-week discussion last month has featured flaring tempers and thousands of amendments proposed mostly by the left-wing opposition, making it impossible for lawmakers to examine the full bill. Labor Minister Olivier Despot argued yesterday, Thursday, that France's pension system would be running at a deficit within 10 years if we do nothing. 
Macron had been revising the pension system uh, as making it a flagship priority of his second term. Despot described the legislation under consideration as a promise delivered by the president's government. To make this reform, it's also having the courage to conduct it and face the inherent difficulties, the minister said as the debate got underway. Well, well, well. That brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day and the week. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here on Monday for River City Hash Mondays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day, all night, and all weekend for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here on Monday, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TR, des photos de bord de mer, d'un mange à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, d'un mange à d'un hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coère Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver